So, Zach, um, you're, you're at Cundy now, but that's not where you started out. You really are one of those, um, you know, young, migrating winemakers. You have seen a lot. You have seen a lot of experience. So, where'd you start out? You're, you're from California, right? I actually am born and raised in California, yeah. Uh, Sierra Foothills. Sierra, Sierra Foothills. There yeah. you go. Born in Placerville and grew up in Auburn. No, oh, okay. And um, so, um, but you, you actually directed yourself to the wine business early. Uh, what was it about dogs that got you there? <laughs> so kind of my fanciful story is at 14 years old, we had a family friend who was a CPA and an accountant. And uh, the goal in life has always been to drive a pickup truck with my dog and be outdoors. She says, well, you should look into this thing called viticulture. These guys drive around in exactly that. Oh, and they make a bunch of money. <laughs> and at 14, that was it, baby, is off to the races. So, where'd you, at 14, where'd you go with that? <laughs> well, you know, I did, uh, I was an athlete all through school, and um, unfortunately, I could not get into the 4.0 crowd to get into UC Davis right out of school. Um, so I had to actually go to the junior college up there, uh, for two and a half years, did the AAAS to get admitted into the viticulture and enology department at Davis. So you have an enology and viticulture degree? Correct. Right. So you are a true professional, <laughs> and you can prove it. And a lot of people <laughs> go to college for seven years, yeah. <laughs> I, I guess I really liked it. Oh, you were a professional college uh -huh, goer. Uh -huh. um, so, uh, so you get out of college, and um, you had this degree, and what did you do with it? Well, uh, my first harvest would have been in 2002. I actually was a sampler for Sterling, and that was one of the reasons I spent a lot of time in school, is I took the, uh, the fall off so that I could be in the winery in the vineyard. And truth be told, my focus was in the vineyard until actually my first harvest. Um, you know, we learn things about ourselves as we go along, as you will, and uh, I kind of realized I'm a finished product person. So you spend all year growing these beautiful grapes, getting them just right, some asshole winemaker steals them in the middle of the night. <laughs> and then it's kind of, what have I been doing for the last six months? I have nothing to show for it. And so ultimately, it led me to realize that I, I want to have that finished product. I want to be able to say, hey, look, I've missed my friends and my family. I don't see them for three months a year. Every year, you drop off the map. And to have that finished product to share with your family, come back at Christmas time, where have you been? Well, slide that bottle in the middle of the table. This is where I've been. This is what I've been doing. So, makes it a lot of fun. It does. And not only do you have a bona fide degree in enology and viticulture, but you have spent some time overseas looking at other places. You've been to some glorious places. Yeah. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship when I graduated from Davis to go to do French viticulture. So, I actually did a summer in uh, Universe Propont in Toulouse and got to learn viticulture from a French perspective. That must have been interesting. It was interesting. So, um, Do you use a lot of that now? <laughs> in some ways. You know, it was, it was a fun education in the sense that at Davis is a lot of kind of free thinking. Here's what we know so far. Here's what we're looking in directions to figure out how things are going to go in the future. Um, French school was, there is a problem and there is an answer. What? <laughs> I mean, what happened all this free thinking? We're trying to work on this. We're trying different methods. There's very much one answer. So it was really kind of a neat uh, contrast in education, and I really appreciated that. Yeah. And then you, um, then you came back, and you didn't actually go into the wine business, right? Well, you, you were kind of peripherally in the You worked for a company, and what did that company do? Well, uh, you know, I think wine is all about mentorships. And uh, after doing a couple of vintages in France and New Zealand, I actually came back, and I got this first job in Zinfandel, my first harvest, this brilliant, brilliant man, Joel Peterson. <laughs> so that would have been uh, harvest of 2004. Yep. And he was really good. He was too good for us. He moved on. <laughs> there was no room at the end at that point. So, uh, yeah, I did continue on and uh, ended up, uh, and I think I can say this in this room, I ended up on the dark side. I was in Napa for six, seven years in a row. <laughs> But don't worry, I got better. Yeah. I got better. Uh, about seven years ago, I actually ended up with the Cundies. And 
ultimately the reason that I wanted to work for the Cundies is, you know, not only is it amazing to work with a family, better or worse, um, you know, I get to be an 1,850-acre property. It is the largest footprint property in the Sonoma Valley. And my job every harvest is to walk for four hours a day. And I have my pickup truck, and I have my dogs. <laughs> and they go to work with me every day. That was part of the arrangement. Yep. And you guys grow lots of grapes. We yeah. do. We do. And we are a supplier kind of for the industry. We'll keep about a third of our total production, which does include... We have 30 acres of vines from the late 1800s, so about 135 years old now, um, which I'm representing a little bit in the two wines that I brought today. Um, but to get to work with things with that kind of history, um, very humbling, uh, but also incredibly cool. Uh, every one of them is a unique little oak tree um, offering something a little different, and I really appreciate that. So uh, the Cundy Ranch is on the east side of Sonoma Valley in Kenwood. Uh, it's got pretty unique soil conditions, uh, particularly on the hillsides. Parts of it are on the flat and parts of it are on the hill. I think most of the zins on the hill, is that right? That's correct, yeah. Yep. And um, so do you think it's like kind of the perfect growing area for zin? You know, I'd say uh, for me, I think zin is one of those terroir expressive grapes. You really can taste in a wine where it came from. Uh, Sonoma Valley, for me, I think is that nice mix of cool climate where you're going to get a little bit of that kind of spice black pepper characteristic, but also the ripeness to hit those, you know, cherry to blackberry, blueberry fruit notes. Um, so I really do think it has that nice kind of balance of the two. And being on those hills, you know, with a 30-acre block, you have to go through it six separate picks. And that's ultimately based on the amount of shale rock that developed, um, and then, of course, just the temperature differential. One block alone, this 30-acre block, goes about 400 elevation change, which means that every row is a little bit different. And once again, four hours of walking every day is eating grapes. You're looking great. Mm, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so tell us about these two wines. Sure. Uh, from uh, Century Block, tell us about the oak. Tell us about um, it's kind of your approach to winemaking. Tell us all the great things you learned at Ravenswood. Well, actually, uh, you know, I'll toot uh, Joel a little bit more here, is that uh, one of the ones I brought you is Heritage Block. So one of the new projects we've started is about a new five and a half acre planting. Um, that'll be St. George uh, with cuttings that are supplied actually from the Zap Block that Joel actually takes care of um, so that we can create the next generation's old vines in. You know, currently the countries are on fourth and fifth generation. I'd like to think for the seventh and eighth generation, they're going to have their new old vines in ready to go. And so part of this is, is really looking at the, the heritage and the history of a lot of these things. So we always say clones. They're really selections um, from a lot of the original founding families. Um, so this particular one is really my first attempt because the nice thing about starting a new label, we do make three separate Zinfandels. I brought you two. I got to kind of figure out maybe the direction that we want to go with the flavor profile. And ultimately, we have... Some really neat things. Ours is called the Shaw Selection. Um, we also have things like Hearts on Fire, and these are basically vineyard selections. They're not cleaned up. Um, they're genetically dirty, which ultimately makes the flavors. Um, because we grow a lot of grapes, we do have about five different clone certified selections now that are virus-free. Guess what? We don't have near the interest, near the intrigue that you'll find in these old selection vineyards. Um, so hopefully we're setting up for the next generation. So Heritage is the first selection of that. And then the second one is actually the Century Vines Inn. So that is 135-year-old vines. Um, going back into that co-fermentation idea, I'll be honest with you that uh, I tend to do these fermentations in about 10-ton lots. And it's not uncommon for me to grab maybe 100 or 200 pounds of something like a Viognier and crush it in as well. Because part of the neat thing about these sections of blocks we do have unidentified grapes growing in the middle of our Zin blocks. Different colors, you'll have pink, you'll have whites, you'll have all kinds of neat things. And so almost turn that up a little bit more by saying, I like having a little bit of the, that white wine fermented into my reds. So aromatically, hopefully on the second one, you get a little more of that kind of perfume characteristic. And that is very much intentional. Uh, nicely done. 
Uh, the, uh, yeah, we've been working on this heritage block. Um, uh, Keith Cundy is somewhere in the room. Jeff, uh, Jeff. Keith, or Jeff Cundy, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> get my Cundys all mixed up. Yeah, so Jeff is somewhere in the room. Uh, Jeff, hey there. Uh, and uh, he's, um, he's got this idea, this kind of visionary idea that he's like, as Zach says, setting up for the next generation. Uh, so we've been using uh, some of the Zap Heritage clones for uh, this, this block they're putting together. Uh, now those clones have been cleaned up, so they're virus free, but they are interesting. I have them in my own vineyard and it's fun to work with them. So you get a whole range of uh, stuff that comes in. But uh, great place for growing Zinfandel. I'm glad you're making it. Um, it's nice to uh, learn from the best. Yeah, nice, nice, nice. Yeah, exactly. Nice, nice, nice to see somebody who passed through Ravenswood doing good Zin. Appreciate and by the way, Zach doesn't uh, just do uh, Cundy Zin. He's got um, uh, you do do a little Zinfandel for um, kind of a large organization, right? We so do. if you're looking for cheap Cundy, this is where to get it. <laughs> We do make about 50,000 cases of Zinfandel a year. Uh, the selections with a Cundi label is only going to be about 6,000 cases of that. So if you do have a local Costco, Sonoma County, you're welcome. Yep, yep. That would be the Kirkland label. Um, so, yeah. Which you won't see our name on it. You wonder, you, wonder, you wonder how they make those products as good as they are? Zach is, you know, one of the reasons. So thank you, Zach. Appreciate you it. it.